I welcome each of you here in this summit and I thank you for celebrating your essence with us today. facing an unprecedented challenge in the face of a global pandemic. Coronavirus disease has to date killed millions worldwide according to World Health Organization. This health crisis impacts not only frontline staff and clinical leaders but also systems and communities. COVID-19 has also disrupted universities and academic institutions. Within the health field, Schools of nursing are bracing for unique challenges related to their role in helping develop the next generation of care providers. Today's episode focuses on the unique needs and concerns of nursing educators and nursing students in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. The conversation at hand will hopefully allow us to appreciate the challenge and enable great cooperation among educators students, parents, and all stakeholders. How to ensure quality nursing education in the face of pandemic? This is the question that we will be answering today. 
Ethically, we have to consider weighing the value of education against the risk and the strain to the learner personally and professionally. Students expressed concern about what an interruption in their nursing education would mean for their future careers as registered nurses. Many students in clinical placements were in their final focus clinical practicum and thus close to successfully completing their program when the pandemic hit. Drawing from first-hand experience on solving this issue, our top deans from the Philippine nursing schools, we have invited them today. We have invited Dr. Maria Luisa Owayan, Dean of Nursing from Our Lady of Fatima University, Dr. Restituta Tan, Dean of Nursing from the La Salle Medical and Health Sciences Institute, Dean Anonsasyon Talusig, Dean College of Nursing and Allied Sciences of St. Paul University, Philippines. Also, we enjoined a resource guest, no other than the co-CEO of Lecturio Germany, Mr. Estefan Wisbor. Estefan, for the information of everyone, is the co-CEO of Lecturio, as I've mentioned. He finished a degree on economics, leadership, psychology, and systems dynamic at Harvard University. He also took his master's on MPA Public Administration at Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. Lecturio is a learning management and online core solution that provides education materials in the fields of medical sciences, clinical sciences, pre-med, and nursing. The solution also offers employee training videos that cover organization principles and goals. A team of experts from Lecturio also guide users on content creation and how to create and share interactive viewers, videos from viewers. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to be with these beautiful people inside this room. Welcome to Hero Ed TV. Thank you again for saying yes to be with me this afternoon here in the Philippines. Thank you, Stefan, Dean Ann, Dean Louis, Dean Resti. Thank you so much for being with me. Good afternoon from us in the Philippines and also good morning from for Estefan, um, streaming live from, from Germany. How are you? How are you? Thank you. I'm keeping well. It's 8 o'clock in the morning here, so um, uh, I'm feeling fresh. I uh, did my morning exercise routine, you know, I try to follow the health advice that you all give out uh, to your patients, hopefully, to, to move and so on. And um, so very pleased to be with you and uh, nice memories uh, of my last trip to the Philippines uh, was to the Association of Philippine Medical Schools uh, Conference, but it's a while back and um, hopefully with pandemic lockdowns, uh, uh, you know, easing sometime in the next six to 10, 12 months, you know, maybe we'll get a chance to visit again and see each other face to face. But we've been keeping busy here, working uh, from a home office, which for our type of business is much more doable than if you run a, a, a you know, a hospital or a nursing school. And so it's been a very productive time for us, actually. Wonderful. Since you mentioned about work from home, you know, set up right now, I'd like to ask the deans um, right now, how is it? How is it working from home? How's the experience so far? Dean Louis. Working from home is fun because you have a home and you have a work. <laughs> I don't think for everyone. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, good, okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so actually with me, uh, working from home is kind of challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, there is some downside of it because, um, of course, we are new with this digital space and then we have to adjust uh, everything. And of course, there are also considerations because of the, uh, sometimes we don't also recognize the difference between office time and home or family time. Um, there is a tendency for us to, to overwork. Mm -hmm. That's why we are really prone to develop a kind of burnout, a digital kind of burnout. And the good side of this is that we don't need to wear formal attire all the time. <laughs> yes. We can uh, we can be in the meetings without our makeup on. <laughs> yes. 
we can shift from one meeting to another just by clicking the link. Mm -hmm. No yeah. travel time to consider. Yeah. We're helping the environment. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, same here, Paul. Uh, the working from home is a uh, challenging. It's a challenging experience. See, we need to create an office within the home. No? So, you, I reserve a corner in the house, oh. and uh, you would say, "This is where I work." So that's when I get into that small corner. Then I would feel, "Ah, I'm working." And when I get I get out of that corner, I say, "Oh, I'm a, I'm a wife at this moment." So yeah, it's easy you know, to to shift, be shifting from one uh, task or role uh, uh, to the other. But it's really challenging to, uh, as uh, Dean Rusty said, looks like um, you make yourself available 24 hours, in seven days a week, and it's rather exhausting sometimes. But what you hear from you know, uh, colleagues and students uh, would also be invigorating you, especially if they have good feedback or good experiences. Right. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes, I feel you. I feel the same. I've, I've applied the one place, one function kind of thing. So when I'm in this corner, this is what I do. So one place, one function. I'd like to, I'd like to uh, have a little chit chat with our dear CEO of Lecturio here, Stefan. Um, I'd like to start the first question, Nesifan. How challenging was it for Lecturio to support a quality um, education for nursing uh, along, along you know, that, that line since the pandemic hit? Yeah, yeah. Um, so for us, um, you know, uh, luckily the, the kinds of things we have been creating and producing um, were the ones that... Uh, help a lot with this kind of disruption, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if, you, if you have the option to take your entire learning online and you have to do it live, online, people, people sitting in Zoom calls for you know, hours per day, um, then um, that is quite challenging. And we've heard some of the challenges, you know, I get some of this at home as well. I have two kids that are uh, currently in lockdown homeschooling, you know, something that's normally illegal in Germany. Mm -hmm. But obviously, when there's a lockdown, then it's all fine. And um, that has its challenges, no question. And um, at the same time, we've tried to um, respond to the additional challenges that this has presented. You know, so Lecturio, in terms of design, you know, has this whole video library, a lot of tracking questions, has uh, capabilities for uh, students to learn asynchronously and for educators to sort of give assignments to those students so that when they do synchronous sessions, they can build and optimize those sessions, uh, you know, leveraging the analytics and, and learnings from what the learners did in the asynchronous preparation. You know, so they are able to see activity, understanding, confidence, and, and so they can prioritize. So can say, there were 10 concepts here for this session, and of, this, of these 10 concepts, you were struggling with three or four, and the typical mistakes you made were those and those, and all those kinds of things were already there. We enhanced them a bit further. Um, we did recognize that remote assessment was going to become a challenge, and, and also that clinical disruption to the, the actual practice you were mentioning earlier wow. um, around the clinical placement and practicums and so on, right? Um, so that, that was going to be a challenge. So we, we, we took it as an opportunity to say, okay, how can we um, uh, enhance and integrate those things mm -hmm. into a, a more effective flow uh, for the learners and faculty. So um, the first thing we did was create an integration with a simulation solution um, and um, where you can really talk to a patient, order tests and get results and feedback and so on. So at least uh, a step closer to the clinical reality that was shut down uh, than just watching a video or answering a case, case, case question. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we did more from the educator's perspective is uh, build an integration with the proctor in solution so that it's easy to um, and affordable um, to, to remote uh, proctoring. So do exams where you can record your learner if you wish, you know, you track and secure the room and all these kinds of things. And, and obviously, um, you know, teaching institutions leverage that in different ways. But those were ways that we tried to make it then even more. And that was hard work as well. So we didn't say like, okay, great, but like, it's just like, uh, let's ride the wave, which has a positive impact for us. But we really worked very hard as well ourselves, um, trying to optimize uh, for this setup, you know. So that's what it's been like uh, for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to ask our deans, 
uh, because this is something that they've never faced before. This kind of challenge, this kind of like, you know, it's a real drill. They were, you know, it's like an earthquake drill that really has an earthquake right there and then. You know what I mean? That's how I see this uh, thing that happened. How unique was this challenge to our teams in the in the panel right now? How unique was this? Okay. Yes, Din Louis. Yeah, I think for for us, it, this is not like a the earthquake drill. This is really phenomenal because before, when there is something that went that goes wrong, we say you go by the books or you go to the admin manual mm. or you go to the you follow the drill. You know the right. drill. You follow that. But there was nothing prepared for a phenomenal like pandemic. Oh, so we were yeah. all, you know, we were all swimming in a, this big ocean of a big wind. Until we have to find something and look into something that would lead us ashore to make something fluid more concrete for us for this uh, for almost a year. So this phenomena had even better persons out of us. And I think I, for the Our Lady of Fatima University, it is more uh, rooted in the leadership of our institution. Dean Resti, thank you. How about Dean Resti? <laughs> yes, uh, Dean Louie, I can feel you. Uh, uh, this uniqueness really brings out uh, a lot. Uh, it, uh, the, the challenges, it, uh, the uniqueness also in yeah. today's situation challenges our mental, our psychological resilience, our physical resilience to what is happening. So, uh, but at this point, I think it helps us because uh, it makes us more um, more uh, more able okay, mm. to adjust to this kind of challenges and then um, for me uh, it really takes a lot of uh, wisdom, patience yeah. and of course the help of our colleagues through collaborative efforts so that we could surpass this kind of uh, this critical situation that we are in right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like the word collaborative efforts. I like that. How about you, Dean Ann? Yeah, uh, this pandemic, uh, uh, because of this pandemic, we all of a sudden found ourselves like we're in a different world, no? Mm -hmm. where we cannot exactly do what we have been doing the, the usual way. Right. So there were questions, we were frowning, but uh, after that, we have really to, to say, uh, let's, let's stand up, no? let's face this. And right. I think this pandemic, it, pandemic is not really huge enough that we cannot really, you know, uh, 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 manage. No? Mm -hmm. So we believe that uh, we can do something about it. So right. let's allow ourselves to get through this. And along the way, we, you know, we try to discover, we become more creative, we become more positive. And the more we became more guided by the vision of the university, you know, what is it that, what, that we really want? So despite these changes, mm -hmm. you know, and this sudden change really is uh, that guiding star uh, would be our vision for um, the vision of the university and for our college. You know? So whatever we do, we keep that uh, in front of us. And I think we were able to you know, do something and still you know, not only survive, but thrive actually. Right. So we're here now, still right. fighting and looking, you know, and, and hopeful, being hopeful. Wow, yeah. right. I, I feel resiliency all over the place. <laughs> Wonderful. But how did you, how did you um, proceed to like steer your will and say, okay, there has to be a continued learning. We have to move forward. Um, what, 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 what was like the the actions you've taken to to get there so that there will be no academic freeze and no quality sacrifice at all. Yes, no. I think what we, uh, what is the primary thing that we did was to harness technology. Right. Because before that, people was a little bit ambivalent. It's too expensive. Right. It's too difficult to manipulate. We have to train so many people. Mm. But with this pandemic happening in, and all of us are connected digitally, 
we have to embrace really strongly and take control right. of technology that is before us. Right. And there were a lot of platforms that were available. There was a lot of softwares, learning softwares that we were not uh, we were not aware before mm -hmm. and was introduced to us through the pandemic. And now we're trying to slowly and surely take the grasp of this technology because I know from this time on there's no turning back. Right. Technology right. will still will always be part of our lives even after the pandemic right. and beyond. So what our university, our Lady of Fatima University did was to really embrace it because way back 2018, mm -hmm. our president, Dr. Caroline Enriquez, she really uh, pushed us through the LMS, which is Canvas, and mm -hmm. she keeps on telling, populate it, populate, populate. Mm -hmm. You know, like, this was new terminologies for us. And then came 2019, 20, and then we have the College of Medicine initiated Victorio, and we also jumped into that where we're planning. Remember, Bryce, we had the initial meeting. Right, right, right. So this is what we're doing now, because there's no other way but to embrace technology. And with that, technology is the, you know, the technology is the hardware, the something that is, we look into our people. Mm -hmm. So Dean Tan was mentioning about resiliency. Right. So we have to look because management is people and relationship and management of the technology materials. So after that, we take care of our people because Fatima is family. Right, right. So we tend to consider that there is no I in teamwork. Right. So we group together, put all our resources together and work as a team. So technology and team, yeah. that's a good byline, isn't it? Right, technology and people agree. <laughs> yeah. But was there I mean, any resistance yeah. from well, mm -hmm. anything new given all of these stresses and all of this? Was there an evident resistance? Um, no, 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 no. None. Because it was introduced 2018. All right. So by the time it, 2020 was here, ah, oh, now let's have to, we embrace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a resistance in 2018, 2019, but when they realized 2020, we cannot do anything but go digital. Mm -hmm. So we do things electronically. Mm -hmm. So everybody embraced. I think we were introduced early. That's why when 2020 come, came, it was very easy for us to embrace. Though there were a lot of difficulties along the line, but majority of us were really, yes, let's take this, let's do this. Right. And there was, you know, the fear of academic freeze was on us, especially in nursing, because we have the most number of students in the university. And I have to really be at the front line of that academic freeze to convince my student. We have a sauna, you know, the state of the nursing address, mm -hmm. which wow. I left, you know? Wow. During that address, I really stressed to the students, we cannot go on a freeze. Right. You float with us. Right, right. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Wow, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. similarly, uh, Dean Lowy, uh, we encountered uh, the same challenges, but the initiatives and the strategies of the College of Nursing, of the LaSalle Medical and Health Sciences, we're a product of a collaborative efforts of the administrators, mm -hmm. the faculty, the staff, and the students in synergy with the academic services department of the La Salle Medical Health Sciences Institute and was headed by the vice chancellor of the academics, Dr. Juanito Cabanas. Mm -hmm. So alongside with the academic, uh, the, the colleges, the academic supports, which uh, involves our library, our Center for Innovative Education and Technology Integration. We have our academic quality management, our Center for Community Engagement and Health Development Programs, the Center for Internationalization, mm -hmm. Academic Affiliations and Engagement, all these things together with the Registrar and the Student Affairs. We were one. Uh, when we pushed for this uh, continued education, continuous employment for all the faculty and the staff of this school. So uh, we, when we came up with the actions, so together with the colleges of this institute, at first uh, we really had to shift suddenly mm -hmm. to online learning through our home-based learning alternative modalities. And faculty members have to undergo several trainings, workshops, on how to navigate the LMS and other digital platforms to deliver the remote education to our learners. Mm 
The luck was on our side when the LMS was initially rolled out by the academic services uh, early on prior to the occurrence of pandemic. Thus, the transition was quick though there were glitches and issues that were identified and corrected promptly. So communication with the students and parents are also, have, was also in place, uh, providing them the guidelines about our home-based learning alternative modalities. And of course, on the part of the faculty, the students, I mean, the, the administrators, of course, patience and tolerance were demonstrated. Assessment of the student's capability for online learning was done. So there were a series of survey and comments from all the stakeholders, uh, which were considered uh, coming from the admin, the faculty, the students, and the parents. Because not all of the faculty members came from this young generation. Mm -hmm. So those who, who are bo uh, baby boomers or the millennials has really had to adapt to this new uh, strategy that we have to we have to uh, to to use. But at first, we also had to revise our syllabi to mm -hmm. fit the online classes. Then uh, we also addressed the concerns of our students. So tuition and other fees were adjusted in view to the online delivery of classes uh, to the advantage of the students, especially those financially compromised, mm -hmm. because uh, there are a number of students also have a pro uh, with parents already lo who also lost their jobs, mm -hmm. uh, they lost employment, so they had problems with how to pay. So. Uh, Instantly at that time, uh, starting last second semester and then uh, this first semester, first semester, there was no tuition fee increase that were asked. And it was also uh, projected that until next school year, there will still be no tuition fee increase in our institution. Just uh, that is a response of our institution to our students' needs. Then, of course, we started our subscription of our online resources. So instead of textbooks, we use ebooks and uh, other resources that we could use for our related learning experience for our students. And of course, we have to retool our faculty members with uh, like, uh, other um, so resources like the Zoom, like the uh, Mentimeter, and all the other things that we could use for instruction. Right. So these are things that are really, um, really hard at first. But uh, as we go on, I'm just so happy to share that among our faculty members, more than 50% of them have uh, done a lot of trainings and workshops just to be uh, adept and be updated with what is new now you, uh, within our situation. Mm -hmm. um, majority of them, uh, if not 100%, already are into uh, uh, adjusting in the use of our LMS. So these are things that are um, really hard at the start, but uh, right now it seems uh, they're already comfortable with, with what they're doing. Of course, there are some glitches somehow, but it can already be remedied. Mm -hmm. So in the event that um, we, there is already a face-to-face -face, um, classes that we have to uh, we have to follow then maybe uh, there, there's still this online or remote education that is very helpful that could help our faculty our administrators uh, to utilize uh, just to maximize our time mm -hmm. and of course our resources wow. thank you thank you Dean how about Dean Ann? Yeah, uh, the pandemic, you know, the announcement of the pandemic uh, occurring and the, you know, the, the quarantine, the lockdown uh, um, intervention uh, uh, actions here came, came during the uh, first semester you know, of, in the university. We just, have, we just opened the university the semester that was uh, February and then came March. You know? So all of us, uh, we were prepared for the face-to-face, -face, you know, uh, conduct of classes and everything. But all of a sudden, we need really to to shift to this online thing. And we were really caught by surprise and unprepared. But one thing uh, very important here that we did was first to really uh, maintain communication amongst the faculty because we're already in this that semester and trying to, you see, uh, check out, check on the... Uh, the adjustments, you know, the flexibil flexibilities that uh, we are all doing. 
And uh, even if we just, most of us just use data, no, we were not really uh, 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 subscribed to the internet no, at home because we always stay in the university uh, most of the time of the day. So we, uh, everyone uh, w would um, share resources no, just so to be able to communicate. And while staying at home, it really gave us time to really uh, become updated. We were uh, looking at the um, announcements and developments through the television and the radio, and we keep passing that on to each other and say, what do we need to do and how are we going to do this? Especially uh, that uh, we cannot e anymore bring our students to the uh, clinicals no, for their related learning experience. So what are we going, going to do? So what are the the adjustments and the other options that are open to us and that's doable you know, there. And after that, uh, we need, we focus also on orienting. See, there are a lot of uh, reactions from our students and parents. So we have, uh, we have to do a lot of, you know, series of orientation you know, about what's happening and what are our plans because they need to know uh, where are we now headed to and what are the, what is the university's plan. And uh, of course, uh, frequent meetings, discussions, no, and planning uh, between and among the faculty and the coordinators. And um, you know, uh, really teamwork, no, was was uh, was really very uh, evident from uh, within the entire university. Our president, you know, also because our president uh, tried to, you know, uh, she has a lot of, uh, she collaborated with a lot no, of uh, friends and, and one of them is Dr. Bryce. And uh, of course, that's how we came to get into lecture, you know? So our president uh, led us into also finding other ways by which we can deliver our lessons, especially for the the, the doing part, the skills lab part. And so we got into lecturio and we had another orientation and for the students and faculty, faculty onboarding for lecturio until we were able to see how the necessity, the value of, of uh, you know, uh, adapting lecturio and now the students enjoy it. No, and then also um, keeping in touch with the other organizations, professional like ADPCN, of course, Dr. Bryce, Chet, and others know that uh, we need to, where we can also find some assistance or, 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 or help. And I think everyone, uh, looking back, I saw that everyone was working mm -hmm. from the president down to, you know, our vice presidents, even vice president for finance and uh, down to our students. And so now, nakatawit, now we were able to get where we are now and right. I think we can move on, no, uh, no matter what happens in the future. Thank and you thank so you. much, thank you. Listening to all of them, uh, Stefan, what do you think now is the future of the nursing education, at least from where Doctorio is looking? Yeah, that's a very good question. Firstly, let me just congratulate you all for your leadership uh, in those challenging times. You know, you, you have big ships to sail there and uh, a lot of things had to happen in a short time. And uh, from the way you, you explained it, I could see you did it with care for all involved in a very collaborative way and so on. You know, um, uh, all of which I see as qualities that are often stronger in female leaders than male leaders, and we need more of them. So congratulations and my hat off to what you have managed there. Um, so uh, let me highlight one thing, I think, um, in terms of the outlook and the future. You know, I think one thing that's clear um, is that uh, uh, however the new normal looks when we go back, you know, uh, how soon will we have, what size of gatherings, with what degrees of prevention and so on, um, I think some, one thing has definitely changed, and that is simply that people have experienced a different reality, right? right. So, uh, as you were all saying, like, this was like completely new territory, you know, uh, like how you said very clearly, uh, Dean Louis, you know, like there was no playbook, you know, there was no manual, no drill was ready that just had to be executed. You know, obviously, we need to get those drills ready, you know, we, I don't know, you know during the evil of pandemic, people like, uh, Bill Gates and so on were saying clearly we need global monitoring, we need to be better prepared and so on. And no, the world overall was poorly prepared, you know. And I think that's clear to everybody, so we'll change that for the future. But um, what it means also is um, that people have seen this alternative way of delivering, right? And, um, and then 
that is definitely just something you cannot undo. You know, so we all have that in our memory, whatever we make of it, you know, and then uh, certainly there will be leaders that think like, okay, finally we can go back to normal, we don't have to spend time on Zoom anymore, and whatever else. But I, I think many, and uh, many of you hinted in that direction already, um, uh, sort of said, you know, well, this will be, you know, we've learned something here that we're going to incorporate in some way in what we do in the future. You know? and, and Dr. Horner, for, um, our director of, uh, uh, of education, uh, he always kind of, you know, says like, these are constraints that we've been through that have been very severe, very sudden constraints, but they really also present opportunities, you know, and the opportunity, um, uh, that the, the guiding light that he sees for that opportunity um, is very much in, in medicine in general, you know, we teach evidence-based medicine, right? But the way it's taught in many places is not very evidence-based in terms of learning science. Huh? And, and so he really sees the, the, the constraints as an opportunity to bring more learning science into an education process. You know, to, and, and that effectively, in practical terms, I think, will mean that um, it will be more blended you know, mm-hmm. um, and, and have stronger digital elements. But um, ideally, that doesn't just become, how should I say, an optimization of logistics and time and space, which it can be, of course, no question. Like, that's why we had to optimize, because we couldn't come physically together. But uh, leverage the power of these technologies. You know? So once you have the content, on a digital platform, or you have a digital platform that already has not only content, but has it has it all clearly structured, has it all tracked, has features like space retrieval, for example. You know, like both nursing students and any health science students have to remember a fair amount of different kinds of concepts, and you want to, as educators, create long-term mastery of those concepts. You know, so things that you know a platform can do, like a space retrieval, that brings even correct answers back to your learners at personalized intervals. It's very hard to replicate, you know, with a mm. physical tutor or, or, or a coaching session. You know, that's like very piecemeal, very optimized, very personalized. You know, so therefore, to take the opportunities presented to uh, not just mix on and offline better in terms of logistic convenience and cost and other things, but really have the learning science as the guiding light in terms of the opportunities mm. that it all presents. You know, so that we can teach in a more data-driven manner. That the time we spend face to face is optimized for the group. That we're teaching, uh, and so on, and, and I think that that really presents a big opportunity, and um, different kinds of systems uh, and places will capture it in different ways. Um, but the certain thing is, you know, like everybody will remember what's possible digitally, and then different people will integrate it in different ways in their teaching. But to me, this is the best guiding light we could pick. It's the learning science, less the sort of just only the physical disruptions. Obviously, we'll look at that, but really use the learning science as the guiding light for optimizing for the future. Thank you. Wonderful. Deans, if you have questions also, we can just, you know, um, come up with a free conversation. Just feel mm-hmm. free to also shoot your question just in case. All right. Also, All right. to our audience, um, we are also encouraging you to just type in your question in the box. If you're uh, watching via live on uh, streaming, please, so that I can, I can just read it and address it to whoever you want to answer the question. All right. Thank you. I'm just curious. Uh, well, of course, some of you mentioned this already on the initial uh, out in the outset, but I would just like to uh, ask: How is the student-faculty relationship uh, now that you know things are are heavily virtual? Has there been better relationship that was developed, or are there some tensions along the way? Dean Ann, may I ask you first this time? You're still muted, Tina. Thank you, Sir Stefan. Yes, to faculty student relationships. Um, well, at the beginning, you know, since uh, everyone is new and there are a lot of questions and uncertainties, well, uh, looks like there are, you know, uh, misunderstandings or hesitation mm-hmm. you know, on both parts. You know, but I, as I said, I keep telling them communication um, helps a lot. So if we sustain that and maintain uh, communication lines open, then we can understand each other. And they did. So they started to, you know, um, creating group chats per course, and they were, you know, uh, sharing uh, concerns or um, uh, achievements or successes, little successes. And faculty, you know, uh, 
I learned also to monitor them really closely. And uh, most of my faculty would say, they, they would accommodate students' questions and, and uh, qu uh, uh, concerns even, you know, uh, beyond five or until 12, they, the, the students will, will signal that, hey, mom, this, uh, there's a question and there's a no. And, you know, um, some of the faculty members, just to make sure that students' uh, needs are addressed, would even get out of their way. You know, there was one who was saying that um, um, she went to the house of the student you know, because they, they and then to deliver the lesson, you know, the, the material, and then goes back and take the, the output, and then you know, and then so the, the student can you know accomplish something, accomplish the task. So that that's one instance where the faculty gets get out of their way. And uh, students also were able to, you know, learn how to give feedback and appreciate the teacher, you know, how much they are doing for them. And so this makes also the faculty, you know, have a positive, you know, a positive energy or pos motivated. They get more motivated and they can do more. And so when I hear that, I also, you know, are positive and positively uh, affected and so I also am encouraged to do more you know, despite all of these difficulties and challenges. So I think that uh, uh, that was very very important. So now they you know they communicate well, they are the students are open and the faculty are open also. We don't see, uh, we don't take comments from students as complaints but they are you know these are feedback no feedback and points to that we can use to reflect on and make uh, things better as we go along. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Anyone would like to share from our panel? Uh, may I share? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Yes, okay. So actually, um, it just dawned on us, on, on me particularly, because before the pandemic, uh, faculty or teachers already played the role as a second parents mm -hmm. of our students. Uh, when the remote learning happened, it's more like the parent-child relationship was again uh, demonstrated mm -hmm. uh, because students could just uh, message the faculty, could just uh, communicate through uh, SMS, most often through FB Messenger, yes, that's, you're right, Dean Ann, and of, uh, email, and even outside from the consultation hours, these students are still being accommodated by our faculty members. And even myself, if they get to email me, uh, it's always it's it's uh, it, it's always a, a kind of um, a, a part of an obligation on my part to respond quickly or promptly as much as possible mm -hmm. because I know uh, students will not just email you or send you questions if it not if it is not really important. Mm -hmm. So for us, it may not be important, but being it uh, brought out to the open, that means it is an important concern for them that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. That's why open communication is now uh, a kind of, uh, is, is really, it's not only encouraged, but it should be demonstrated. Right. So um, all the students' concerns are being heard and uh, we act on it according to our capacities and of course uh, within reasons. And uh, there are also some instances that the students may just message the faculty at a very unholy hour or 12 o'clock till midnight or 1 o'clock a.m. And that's the point that I have to remind the faculty members that please set limits. Boundaries. Because right. you are not robots. You are right. also human. Right. You need also to rest. You need to have a complete sleep so that the next day you can work again and then fulfill what are the demands that right. are needed from you. So these are things that we really still have to, to, to remind our students that all of us are suffering, all of us are being challenged, mm -hmm. and all of us have to cope. Right. Dilo yeah, you want to say something yeah. too? Because uh, before, our concern with our students was just the age gap. You know, mm -hmm. students are younger, we millennials, and we are on uh, a little bit uh, Gen X. Or Gen. But now it's more of there's a collision between digital migrants and digital natives, <laughs> wherein our students are a little bit superior. All right. <laughs> so we, we were able to realize that that's why our faculty will, do, we don't just double our steps. We have to really move a little bit more 
So the training was really crucial at that point. So what we did in order for us to really continue with that, to bridge the gap, is that continuing education in terms of this digital technology. Mm -hmm. Then the second thing is that we keep our eyes focused on our stakeholders, mm -hmm. our students and their parents, and our employees also, our faculty. Because as what uh, Dean Talosig and Dean Tan mentioned, you know, it feels like we're call center agents. We have to, when students give their questions, we have to answer immediately and we have to connect it to another department so that they will get, the, you know, satisfied with our services. Right. Because that's how it is at that time, until we were able to quiet the ocean, you know, the waves started, you know, they relaxed. Mm -hmm. So now we are really bridging that gap and we don't only, we build bridges. Right. We cross the bridge mm -hmm. and probably we will be able to focus on our stakeholders so that the continuity of education will, will, will be realized at the end because we're always focused on the goal, the mm -hmm. vision. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. That's right. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, yes, yes, Stefan, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, two, two brief points I want to pick up on. So, uh, firstly, Dinan, you know, I love your example on the faculty member visiting. Yeah. Somebody at home, you know, my eight-year-old is also being homeschooled, and she has this fantastic, very positive teacher who's, you know, he came to our home and dropped off the stuff, you know, he, didn't, he did that for most of the students, obviously a slightly smaller class size than yours, and it was about 30, I think, um, but and that makes such a difference, you know, if, if the educator shows care, you know, and, and, and what all of you said, you know, the rest of you said, you know, like, oh, it's important for them, you know, you realize you really put yourselves in their shoes, you know, even if the content of the question might be banal, but they, they're affected by worrying about that question. And I could see that care, you know, <laughs> they're calling it a call center. It's interesting, you know, absolutely, you know, sort of, you know, service attitude, right? Um, but you mentioned the digital migrants uh, part, and that's very interesting, I think, from two angles, you know, because um, uh, that's the sort of the second guiding light to my mind in terms of the optimization opportunity. Um, for the future is uh, that there is that clear difference, you know, the, the students are digital natives, you know, and some of you are just as savvy um, uh, with it. It's not an age limit, right? It's just a sort of a, a different distribution there in each group, let's say. Um, but um, that is a definite, very relevant fact in education today that is often ignored to know. And also, because what it means is that the students are out there on the internet, on Wikipedia, on YouTube, and so on, hunting for the content that they're looking for. You know? mm -hmm. and, and, and they like videos a lot, so a lot of videos, you know, but you don't know what they're watching, whether it's the right stuff and so on. And it means there's a lot of self-directed learning time that presents another opportunity, you know, namely the opportunity to turn that into directed self-learning time, you know, where you reconnect, you can track what they're doing, and so on, and that is just a very fundamental opportunity. You know, whatever we make of learning science and everything else, that's just a reality across all the health sciences and the students that are studying today. It's true across all of the subjects, of course. Um, so that is just some, something I think that presents this other opportunity to connect this self-directed learning time. And um, in terms of the digital migrants within your faculty, you know, uh, I think there's definitely this sort of curve. You know, you have some faculty that are on the one hand very digitally savvy, and also very keen and happy to create their own material, you know? And Louis, Dr. Louis, your curve might be different, yes. <laughs> You're getting to paint it with your hands, maybe. But um, the opportunity I just want to highlight there is, there it's very helpful if you don't have to build everything together in terms of content and system, you know? If not all of your faculty have to create all these things from scratch. You know, let them start where it gets interesting, you know? Let somebody explain in an optimized uh, fashion, the basic concepts, let them get engaged where it gets interesting, where it's a discussion with the students and everything else. But also, obviously, don't, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, make it easy for the ones who do want to create stuff, you know, that they, they, they can do it. But, uh, and then final point is just on the system side, you know, you mentioned Canvas and there are these systems. And uh, it's also important to recognize they're very powerful tools, just like Excel, for example, is a very powerful tool. But many of us don't use, you know, visual basic programming on Excel. You know, like even I don't use it, even though I studied mathematics and run a, run a complex business as well. And and so, um, therefore, having systems that have some content ready for you 
allow you to add content and have a lot of this analytics, which is a lot of additional work to create ready for you, can just make it a lot easier. You know? So that's just um, my, my, my comments on, on what you shared there about faculty student relationships. Thank you, that's fun. Yeah, I, I, like, I like everything I heard. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, what, what are the plans that, that our deans have to actually continue the improvements towards the digital, the digital transition? Do you have plans in the future to like move forward? Shall I speak first? Arrest, yes, please, then <laughs> Dean Resty, yeah. thank you. Actually, uh, we are very positive on the plan to have blended learning, mm -hmm. or maybe we have some courses that we have to continue uh, doing uh, on a remote type of education and online learning. But first, we have to evaluate and maintain those online sources that we prove to be effective for online teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now, we already have determined the courses that, that we can offer in the next school year that can be delivered through blended learning or purely online. So since uh, we already have discovered our capability, our strengths, uh, while we, we use this kind of modality uh, and at this, in this, during this school year, the first semester up to the second semester. Now, uh, the weaknesses that we have uncovered were also considered as eye-openers that are considered as areas for improvement. So, um, it is positive that uh, our, our uh, educational system is now being influenced by the digital world so there is no way for us but to move forward and uh, adjust and, of course, adapt. Right. Thank you. How about Dean, um, Louis? Are there plans? Yeah, uh, for the Our Lady of Fatima, I think you heard a few days ago or last week, uh, Our Lady of Fatima is moving towards the limited face-to-face. -to -face. Mm -hmm. yeah. So because at the start of the pandemic, that summer of 2020, we started to flex. Flex is a Fatima learning experience wherein we did blended learning, distant learning, mm -hmm. uh, applied through the use of technology. Right. Now we are moving towards the limited face-to-face -face based on the joint memorandum circular by CHED with other LGUs. Mm -hmm. But we are trying to do this in close collaboration with our LGU, with IATF, so that everything will be safe. But still, because the JMC, the Joint Memorandum Circular, puts there, stated that there should be no prejudice for those who will not go to face-to-face. -to -face. So we still are strengthening our technology-based blended learning and distant learning strategy. And that's wherein we keep on continuing, continuing our training in terms of the digitalization, electronic right. use of technology in nursing. But still, we are for limited face-to-face -face now. All right, all right, okay. Dean Ann, thank yes, you. Yes, for St. Paul to, uh, yes, we are trying to look back, uh, evaluate you know, how we have done things uh, from the first time, and then this first semester, and then what else we can improve on, like uh, uh, in terms of technology and the, you know, the, the dynamic instructional plan and the dynamic instructional system that the university has. Of course, looking especially into the teaching learning um, activities, no, uh, which would now emphasize the use of, you know, uh, the blended no, approaches to teaching learning. And we're looking also at the moment uh, on um, enhancing or revising uh, our uh, uh, evaluation uh, tools, uh, making it more appropriate to what we are doing and just to ensure also that our competencies, student competencies are taken into consideration you know, uh, all the time. And um, sustaining faculty uh, uh, interest and uh, ex uh, competency, of course, in the use of uh, online learning. And um, I from observation, I see that the faculty have, 
have certain uh, strengths you now which we I can actually uh, capitalize on. So I may regroup them uh, so that I can have a mix of you know the the techno savvy faculty and mm -hmm. work with uh, uh, organize them um, uh, have them group uh, to the older faculty so everyone gets to learn uh, fast uh, learning by doing because mm -hmm. we cannot always have uh, seminars uh, or webinars uh, to that effect so we can uh, do that uh, learning by doing and. Um, Looking and there is now uh, we are now strengthening collaboration also with our IT department. I was talking with them, with the dean, and I was telling we want our how do we improve our you know conduct of our online examination. No, right. uh, so we might be able to create you no know, our our own uh, here within the university, and so they're happy naman to to also to help. And of course, strengthening and sustaining our collaboration with you know other organizations and uh, people outside the university because of course our resources are limited, and you know um, uh, we our president is le really leading us and uh, as uh, you know to do a lot and to take you know uh, calculated risks. She would always say that so. We have to uh, get to the same tempo that she's setting, right. and uh, be risk takers, and uh, you know to be courageous enough to to get into even something that may not be very clear uh, or certain at the beginning. But certainly we can, you know, if we get into the forest, we can create the light, so our path will be better guided. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, wonderful, um, Estefan. Now that the stu the schools are are like looking for ways to really um, you know improve their digital transition and all of this, what what can we give as an advice maybe on on how they should be choosing the right platform for them, digital platform for them or resource for them? Do you have? A very good question, yeah, and um, in terms of platform, it's an interesting one because um, uh, most of you already have a platform, right? You mm -hmm. most have some form of learning management system, you know, it might be Canvas, might be Elias, might be Moodle, might be Blackboard, might be some of the brand, you know? and um, uh, they are very powerful systems, obviously, but initially they're empty systems. You know? And um, so the important thing these days is when we look at platforms, don't just think of, um, uh, how shall I say, uh, it's not easy, either or necessarily, but think about the connectivity uh, of platforms and integration between platforms, you know, because there's some easy ways that um, you can get a lot of benefit, uh, by which I mean both a lot of content, but also a lot of structure and evaluation, um, uh, and you can just connect it to your existing system. And also, you don't just think like, oh, I have a Canvas system, so I can't have, you know, lecturial platform as an example. So, um, uh, for example, you know, the platform can be easily um, uh, connected, uh, in our case, through LTI, this will be what the tech people know, you know, these are sort of standard bridges uh, between systems, you know, it's actually quite easy to configure those. So once you put the right two people together on both ends, you know, they know what kind of, you know, a set of data to exchange, which versions of interfaces are there and so on. So think about that kind of opportunities to connect systems um, would be one point um, I would highlight. And um, uh, yeah, and uh, beyond that, really, um, you know, the ideally, how should I say, you know, don't underestimate the complexity of teaching an empty system uh, uh, analytics and things like that. You know, so um, it's a great advantage if you can get not just a library, like you know, a list of videos, of questions, ebooks, whatever it might be, but uh, try to get a smart library. <laughs> uh, so that's certainly when we design what we build. It's really important to us that there are curricular structures uh, and um, and that everything is uh, tagged and, 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 and you know that faculty can like at a push of a button get their analytics you know because if your faculty have to go oh we put, well, now let's analyze you know let's get the IT team to send us some data you get some big spreadsheets and you have to evaluate and sort those to make sense of what was most used what was most understood and so on and that's a lot of time and energy and again you have the same problem that you have to have with your tech, tech technological affinity all of a sudden you have very different 
faculty aptitudes to drive those evaluations and everybody will want to know something different. So look for not just you know a library, uh, but look for the analytics and the intelligence of that. And my final point will be, you know, like, uh, ideally uh, look for customization. You know? So I give you a concrete example. One of the things that we do uh, for all our client institutions is we put their curriculum into the system. Yeah? So you're not kind of saying like, oh yeah, we've got a new system and here's the ebook library and here's this or that, and now please find the right things and somehow make this useful and guide the students and everything else. Um, but actually, uh, you know, kind of here's our curriculum. You know, check it and then if, see if there's anything missing and so on. That'll be a much much easier starting point uh, for you. So those would be my pieces of advice to sort of capture the value of the technology, mm -hmm. not just the content but also the analytics. Look for the flexibility and customization, and look for how you can integrate those. And integration can look different ways. You know, like it, it's not like you shouldn't integrate for the sake of integrating. You know, always focus on what you want to do. Uh, you know, so um, uh, like I studied at MIT uh, some system dynamics. Um, since that's down the road from um, the school that Maria mentioned earlier, that the Bryce mentioned earlier. Um, uh, so, and the, one of the things I said is always never. Always model a problem, never model a system. Mm -hmm. So therefore, when you think about analytics and the configuration and so on, think about the practical thing that you want and need. You know, like, and, and how often do you need it? You know, and and then you will find what is the pragmatic, low effort way of getting it. Because it might not be a complex, deep integration, which can also cause a lot of work. But it might be something like, okay, we can download this every month and put it there or something like that, you know? So, so kind of go for the practical need that you have rather than some theoretical system optimization where maybe the IT guy says, oh, I have to have everything integrated, you know? Think practically in terms of your needs, you know, what, what data do you want to see as, fact, as teams? What data do your faculty need? How often do you need, do they need it in what form and so on? And, and that way you make sure you don't over-specify. You know, that's one of the risks of technologies you sometimes see these uh, procurements, for example, where people come out with you know endless lists of things, and it means they're going to have a very expensive solution, a very slow process, and everything else, and it's often a little bit disconnected from the actual needs. So those would be my kind of pieces of advice: yeah, so analytics, integration, customization, and make sure you don't over-specify and do work from the practical flows that you're trying to implement. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. Spoken like somebody from MIT. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, interestingly, uh, we got one question from our audience right now, and this is addressed to our panelists. Uh, Nenita Panaligan is asking, as nursing deans, how much of your personal values and management skills have affected your prioritization of plans and strategies for ensuring quality education? By mentioning at least three important components, what do you think should be considered by administrators to attend to first to ensure quality education? Wow, wonderful question, Anita. Thank you so much. Anyone from from our panelists can take this question, please. Anyone would like to volunteer, or you you can share. We still have ten more minutes to go before we finally call it a day. Okay, uh, may I answer, sure. Mom Ninita Panaligan? Uh, Mom Ninita Panaligan is a friend. Hello. Right. <laughs> she is uh, president of the PNA and of the Cavite chapter. All right. So, okay, so actually, with uh, talking about the values, uh, the Lasallian values, uh, on, my, on, on, on a personal note, the Lasallian values was still demonstrated. When we made our decisions <coughs> regarding our the sudden shift and the consideration for students, the considerations for the faculty, and of course uh, how, uh, the the quality of education that we would like mm -hmm. uh, to have our state our students, and of course how would it impact the overall the the general okay the general the stakeholders from the parents and uh, even up to the the staff mm -hmm. so all these things are are considered so when you say uh, values are uh, still uh, is still uh, present for excellence we continue to do our uh, survey or evaluation especially in the use of our remote learning mm -hmm. if you would just imagine in the last uh, since 
pandemic occurred second semester of last school year and the whole first semester we are already we are purely on an online type of learning so how are we going to evaluate the quality education that we would like our students to have despite the current situation so uh, students are given questions and they are being evaluated how they how, how they adapt and how are they doing with their studies using this kind of online modality and uh, for the last semester, we had at, at most three times of evaluation. And all these evaluations, uh, if the series of survey uh, was, all, of course, full with uh, some full with emotions, mm. full of uh, surprising, surprising comments. And of course, there is still always that inspiring comments coming from the students that they understand our faculty members. Mm -hmm. They understand how our faculty members uh, is, is strive for excellence mm -hmm. despite the condition and um, to just to share with you because uh, we have this uh, regular semestral faculty performance evaluation we do it uh, during the pandemic and especially now that the online uh, we used another uh, another type of teaching learning so the more that we need to be uh, to evaluate our the conduct of education and our, so our faculty members uh, we have the usual evaluation the 360 degrees evaluation so the faculty members are being evaluated by the administrators the students the peers and even they themselves they have to evaluate them their, themselves on how they rate themselves according to their own performance so this 360 degrees came out like uh, it's it's a signal for us that really it is a concrete evidence that we are still doing well. Mm -hmm. So the 92% of all this, the faculty members who were evaluated the first semester uh, from the College of Nursing rated excellent. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So I say uh, doing the remote learning online will not really uh, have this downside totally for the students but in fact it give me it give them more uh, kind of assurance that whatever the condition we could still continue learning we could still still continue conducting our classes wherever we are right thank you thank you another interesting question uh, is asked by Dina Araneta um, Mom Dina is asking how did the administrators manage the other areas for sustaining quality education other than the instruction uh, other than the instruction new normal mode is it addressed to me no to and to everyone <laughs> maybe dean louis can help us out with this question uh, i like to answer the ethics first all right go ahead go ahead because the question is uh, how much of our ethical components right. were okay let's go back you know, sure. when we Put, when we think about computers, we think it's just about those digital things, computers. But you know, mm -hmm. computers is just 10%. The ethical right. aspect is the 90% because you have to respect privacy, right. communication, the autonomy of persons involved. Right. So what is asked of us as educators in terms of this online learning is our total being, our belief, our the truthfulness the rightness and wrongness of what we are doing. We need right. to be transparent. Right. As what uh, our Lady of Fatima, our logo is Veritas et Mercericordia. So it's truth. So we have to be reflections of truth through digital platform. Right. And it has to be compassion. When students suddenly you are in the middle of a uh, discussion and then she fell off because of poor connectivity, what do you do? Is that called cutting classes also? So what do you do? Do you give her credits for that or whatever? Right. Do you give extra time? So that is what is expected of us when we are online. The same way we are not online. The ethical aspect is as our total being, our total us, mm -hmm. because we are dealing with humans also. Right. It just so happens the platform is different. Now going back to the, aside from the curricular aspect, what other? Total quality management is a circular aspect. Right. So when, even if we are going through the computers, the instruction, we look into the other aspect. We plan, we analyze, we, we look into the content, we look into the, what really, we look into materials, money, manpower, and we look into what really matters. Right. That's another M in management. All right. 
what mm -hmm. really matters to you. We look into the total person. Mm -hmm. We look into the, the feelings. Because you're, we're, you know, we're touching this very digitally. Huh? Everything is concrete. Mm -hmm. So we have to put that particular humane aspect of us. So total quality management is not really lost. You just go to that circle over and over again because it's called total. If you miss a particular part, therefore, you're not doing quality improvement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm learning a lot from your answers. Thank you so much, Dean. Appreciate that. All right. Much as I would like to um, ask all the questions that, that I've received and continue with this kind of conversation because truly it's insightful, inspiring, and very reflective. We have a little time constraint. So I'd be asking you for your short messages because I know that you've gained a lot of insights over the past year, like we're almost uh, one year, right? Two more months and the pandemic when it started is like having its anniversary in, in all of us, right? So um, what are your insights as much as the lessons that you've learned, which can definitely be um, helpful if there's any dean like yourself listening right now to us. Anyone who'd like to share uh, a sentence or two maybe on the insights and lessons as a special message uh, to somebody who's listening right now, who feel, who actually feel you and could really relate to you. Okay, may I start? Yes, then, then rest. <laughs> okay, so what I could say to the deeds who are listening now uh, is that listen to the concerns of all the stakeholders. Mm -hmm but continue to do what is deemed best for the operation of the college. So communication, transparency, and teamwork are keys to counter the challenges brought about by this pandemic. So it's a, uh, it, it, may be, it may be so uh, vague or hard, but uh, these things are the ones that are very important for us to manifest. And uh, of course, being humble at heart will always make us more human mm -hmm. and humane. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Dean, Louis? So, uh, this this pandemic is really something personal for me. In fact, when, uh, before I, you know, before preparing for this, when you invited me, I have to consult a special friend on what I can really share. And then mm -hmm. he enlightened me on this particular aspect that what we are living right now is not just an insight, but it's it, there are four lines of sights that we need to consider. The hindsight, which is we have to understand something that has happened mm -hmm. so that we will not fail again based on what has happened. Right. We have to have an oversight or how are we going to supervise again mm -hmm. the changes that we made? Mm -hmm. And then how are we going to manage that? The third one is when he mentioned about our insight, what is happening now, mm -hmm. the processes, so that you be able to express yourself with those people around you. And another one is the foresight to look beyond, mm -hmm. to look at all the obstacles as opportunities. But after he said all those four things, I begin to realize that there's another side, mm -hmm. our blind side, because people, persons as, as we are, we are not perfect. Yeah. We always have a blind side and we need another person, which is those members of our team to tell us, May mali ata. there's something wrong with this part. Can we revisit it again? So you have your hindsight, oversight, insight, foresight, and please always consider your blind side, so that you'll never get lost right. of the mission, which is the reason for all our sites. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. You just gave me an idea for another invitation that I have to make with you uh, for another <laughs> platform I am I'm doing. Highly motivational. Thank you so much. Dean Ann. You're muted, Dean Ann. Thank you. Well, this pandemic really gave us, uh, you know, pushed us actually to to get into this new thing and, and embrace it and live live in this. You know, this mm -hmm. because, um, well, as we we use we say that we are in the 
um, uh, fourth industrial revolution where the use of technology uh, is now affecting influencing healthcare and of course uh, nursing education. So uh, what happens now is uh, we just need you know, to continue moving on, uh, improving ourselves, but it would be really impor be important mm -hmm. that we keep in front of us the vision what we want to do mm -hmm. you know, what do we want to do uh, what kind of education uh, do we really want to offer mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, to our students and keep that in front of us as i mentioned also earlier and to really also make all the other stakeholders mm -hmm. look into this appreciate this vision because it's the same vision that we all have it's not only the university's vision for quality nursing education, but this is also for them, no? So that right. we are able to produce, you know, as we always say in nursing, the best uh, uh, Filipino uh, nurse for the Filipino, the best nurse for the Filipinos, and the choice of the world. So everyone must be in the same boat, no? in the same uh, situation. And so if we are all together in this, then we can move forward. It's, it's also important really to to be understanding, to understand, no, uh, the world, the, understand where we are in. We, we, there is a need for us also to, you know, um, uh, listen to our stakeholders, uh, right. ask how they are, and uh, they also have plans or suggestions where we can be there. We don't have all the, the answers to our concerns or problems, so they can contribute. Actually, one in, in the experience uh, of doing this um, during this pandemic. We, the, the role of the parents also have shifted. We, we acknowledge that, no? Before they would just, uh, their main responsibility is to be able to pay the tuition fees, send them the students at home, but I to school. But now doing the RLE, the skills lab at home, their role has shifted to be, you know, the patient where the, you know, the students can practice their skills. They are now the counselors, the mentors, because when students start saying, uh, I give up. So we taught the parents, we told the parents when they say that, listen, they need a listening ear right. and a listening heart. Mm -hmm. Don't scold them because that's what they do to us and we listen to them. Right. No, so that's another uh, role there. Uh, so everyone therefore must be able to share so we keep listening to them so they understand how we get to our vision and for all the beings take courage uh getting into the forest may be scary mm -hmm. but uh let's be uh let's take courage to try new things let's yeah. explore let's create together you no know, and uh let's take risks and sharing and collaboration would you know, uh, help us get to our goal in in, in this uh, in nursing. Okay? So that's what I would like to tell them. Thank you. Well said, all of you. Thank you so much. I'm reserving the last, of course, to our only thorn among our among the roses in this <laughs> in this room right now, Stefan. If there's someone listening, oh, up, please it's a high honor. Um, right. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, let, let me just express my respect also for just the depth of not just your care, which I commented on earlier, but all of your sort of conceptual thinking in terms of leadership and values and how you reflect on your work and so on. You know, clearly you're very conscious in, in the ways that you go about doing what you do. You know? uh, so my, my final comments will be, I'll pick up on one I made earlier and then make a second one. And so first, please uh, come back to this point around constraints and seeing the opportunities in the constraint. You know, if we look at history, then uh, all pandemics historically have led to substantial improvements in society and in numerous areas, whether it's around hygiene or, you know, kind of uh, public health capacity, monitoring, many things, you know. And um, so um, let's capture those opportunities also with regards to the learning science opportunities, you know, where... Um, if, if we look critically in terms of, you know, um, uh, the, you know, your, your sites, you know, if we look in hindsight, you know, then we've been slow to adapt to learning science in many places in education. And so there's a real opportunity here to do this, you know. Um, the second part I'll pick up on is this sort of technology and human values interaction, you know, so, which I think is a very interesting and very relevant point. And uh, when you go into things like, uh, you know, online proctoring, for example, which I mentioned, which is integrated, right? 
and um, and, and that, that, that's very quickly become a very polarized debate in terms of the ethics part. You know, like it's just intrusive. What about the privacy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But also to look at that again from you know all stakeholders' perspectives, and in the end, make the human needs the reference there for the conversation. And if you start with that conversation with the right and wrong and the technical aspects. That's one thing. But what is the human need behind the student that has concerns or the parent that has concerns? You know, they, they want respect, they want privacy and so on. But they also have other needs. You know, why were these kinds of solutions built? You know, have a need for effectiveness. They'd love to get their degree and they'd love to get it fully rather than be told we can't, you know, do a face-to-face -face exam. So therefore, we just have to wait, you know. So so therefore, getting creative, you know, whether it's like uh, Dean Ann was saying, I thought it was quite thoughtful, you know, the role of parents, you know, become all of a sudden you know, a counselor at the same time. But that's using the, the set of stakeholders creatively and that's brilliant. Uh, and so, you know, taking the technology and the humanity combined, you know, I think that's very powerful. And if we look at just one visible measurable aspect of this pandemic, which is the speed with which the global community has developed these vaccines, then we're in completely new territory. It's amazing what we have achieved as, mm -hmm. you know, global society in that regard. You know? And now we have the rollout challenges. It isn't that nice that we have the pictures, the vaccines, and then it can get faster than people expect it, you know? So, um, so therefore, you know, in terms of um, putting our heads together on the technology front, there's amazing things that are possible. We're working hard to kind of speed those things up and make them easier. Um, I described some of the subtleties of that. But staying connected on that human side, with clear references in terms of values and the human needs that are behind any resistance and concerns of any stakeholders, I think that's the right way to go about. And I'm very impressed with how you are all sort of, you know, juggling, juggling and managing that. So um, hat off to you and thanks again Dr. Price for including me in this illustrious circle. Thank you. I couldn't thank you all enough for enriching our experience here at Hero Ed TV. Hero Ed TV is here as a platform for thriving. And we are happy that you have been supportive of our advocacy to support our hero community thrive, inspire, and stay connected with one another. So this is our way of sharing or creating a help that helps, and at the same time, allowing everyone to you know, learn from the geniuses that this pandemic had created. And in this room, I have seen four. <laughs> so thank you so much. I appreciate all your answers. I appreciate your time. And more importantly, I really appreciate the passion that I felt in this room today. So thank you so much. This will not be the last invitation ever. I will be connecting with everyone again in the near future. So thank you, appreciate your time. Have a wonderful weekend ahead. Um, ahead. Thank you so yes, much. Thank you too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Bye, Stefan. Thank you. Bye, Stefan. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bryce. Thank, thank you. Bye. 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 I Bye. should see you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so okay. much. I appreciate it. My name is Bryce. I am your host, and I happen to be the chair for Hero Summit Singapore. Thank you, and good afternoon. The BBC couldn't have done a better job, Bryce.